So welcome back to Talking mm-hmm. Trades. With with me, as always, is Randy Beal, who is the business manager for the Atlanta North Georgia Building Trades. And we have the pleasure of having Bruce Carraway from the law offices of Bruce Carraway right down the hall um, to talk a little bit about workers' compensation. If I could, Bruce, could I just get you to give me a brief uh, description of your practice? And then I've got a question for you that will lead us into the conversation. Okay, sure. And, uh, and first of all, I'm uh, honored to be here um, with, you know, talking with the building and trades folks. Um, I've, uh, I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I've only, only represented injured workers during that time period. I'm, I've not represented insurance companies or companies, but I've, I've seen a lot of their dirty tricks. So I feel like I understand what they're doing. Um, you know, I've tried thousands of cases and I'd, I'd like to say I've won them all, but I've, I have not, you know, and you kind of, kind of learn, you know, sometimes I need better witnesses. I need <laughs> better medical. So, yeah. so I think it does help with that experience. Um, uh, you know, I've been with law firms. I've now got my own small firm, um, as indicated, I'm, I'm the best folks I work with are organized labor. I think that it's, it's easier to get, get witnesses, easier to, you know, find out exactly what the job requires. Um, so anyway, I'm happy to be here and talk about, you know, what we can do to protect workers when they're injured. So what <clears throat> what happens? You you go to work, you're doing your thing, and you get injured on the job. What What is the first thing that somebody should think about? What should they do first and foremost? Um, and the, the first and foremost thing is, I mean, document what has happened. Um, I can't tell you how many times people get injured <clears throat> and uh a lot of folks have the cowboy mentality where I've, you know, I've broken my ankle, but, you know, hey, it might just be a sprain and I don't want to be a wimp and I'm going to keep working. And uh, then they call me, you know, three months later and, uh, you know, it's hard to prove the case because there's no proof, you know, that they got run over by the forklift that day because there's no accident report, there's no pictures, there's no witnesses. So if you feel like you've had a, a bad injury, you know, absolutely, you know, take a picture of, of the accident that happened. Um, you know, your coworkers, and sometimes, you know, in the trades, you might be working with some other contractors. So, you know, that guy in the blue shirt, but you don't know his name. You don't know his phone number. So, you know, try and document who it is that saw the accident happened, you know, get their phone number. Um, you know, if you can't even get a, get a statement from them, cause you know, I mean, we've, you know, have a death case now where the, the battery plant, um, up on I-85 and, uh, and those workers are, poof, they're all over the country. You know? So, I mean, we can track them down through discovery. Um, but a lot of times it's tough to find them. So, you know, the soldier in the field would be the worker, um, you know, and the big weapon you have is your cell phone, you know, so, you know, go ahead and, and take a picture of the accident. Um, they're supposed to have a, a list of doctors posted, um, and you have to pick a doctor off of that list. A lot of times they don't have that list posted, or it might just have three doctors. It's supposed to have six. So go ahead and take a picture of that, that list of doctors. So, you know, the biggest thing is documenting what happened. Um, you know, final way to document it, and I was talking to my pre-legal yesterday about, hey, what, what should I talk about? And she, you know, she pointed out that a lot of our clients, they come to me, you know, it might be two years after the accident happened, and, you know, well, when did you go to the doctor? I can't remember. You know, was it a red forklift or a blue, blue forklift? I can't remember. And, uh, you know, believe me, the insurance company knows because they have a video of the accident. They have their witness statements. So they try and trip you up or you say it was red and it was really blue. doesn't matter, but it makes you look like a liar. Uh-huh. So if you keep a, you know, get a, get a spiral notebook, get a legal pad, you know, and just make notes every day as to, you know, my ankle hurts, you know, it swelled up, it turned blue. I told my supervisor. And when you say document, it's important <laughs> to report, report an injury too in the trades. I mean, uh, so, you know, when we get hurt on the job in the trades, uh, I was foreman, ran crews of 40 people and and the first thing I would tell them in in the morning would be you know if there's an injury today be sure to report it because an injury that's not reported didn't happen yeah in 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 some cases I mean an employer would you agree sometimes they'll say well you got home and hurt yourself you ever had that happen absolutely and that's a that's a good question Randy is that um you know and I was talking about documenting it doesn't matter if you document it all in your your notebook but don't tell anybody <laughs> yeah 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 right right um, right yeah, you need so, to you need to report it to the company correct yeah, yeah and so so legally you know the Georgia law says you have to report it within 30 days of your injury problem is if you wait 29 days to tell somebody you know I broke my ankle they're going to say well isn't it true you went to that Super Bowl party or you played golf or you know that after you broke it and so we think it was because of that so yeah. you have 30 days, but, you know, report it the day that it happened. I mean, I've got a case now where the lady, 
you know, had a truck accident. You know, she bumped something, jolted her back, you know, had bad problems, but kept working, didn't tell anybody. So, yeah. you know, I think if we'd gone to court on that case, it'd be tough to prove it happened at that time because she didn't tell anybody. I've never heard the 30 day thing. I, I, I know when I repped at Sheet Metal, <clears throat> um, I had a, I had a guy that, and you know, we're tough, you know, trades people, you know, we can uh, make it through anything, but this person uh, hurt his back. Didn't his coworkers knew he got hurt. Mm-hmm. He didn't report. Um, he went home, went to bed, going to sleep it off. Right. Next morning, he can't even get out of bed. He has to crawl to the bathroom, slide into the tub to use the bathroom because he can't even get up to use the toilet, right? And a two-year battle ensued to uh, get this uh, claim. And in that two years, he lost his house, he lost his car, he lost his marriage, right? Mm -hmm. All because of something that happened on the job. And uh, fortunately, I mean, after all that, you can say fortunately, but the only way it finally got rectified is I was able as a trustee to finally convince the health fund that it was not a worker's comp claim because he had claimed it was the whole time. Mm -hmm. And eventually I had to tell him to let that go or he was never going to get his back fixed Mm -hmm. in the story. And we got it fixed under the health and welfare plan. Mm -hmm. Now, he would tell you to this day, it was because he heard it on the job. But, sorry, we had to, I mean, at that point, how long can they starve a person out? Well, and, and you know, I'll, I'll digress for a second. I mean, you know, politics matter. You know, the, yes. so, the, so the Georgia legislature, you know, makes the laws that cover Georgia workers' compensation. And so currently, you know, if, if you get injured and you, everybody, hey, I saw him break his leg, and the insurance company says, we're not paying. Um, you know, we go to the you know, different levels. We go to before a judge, and it's not a jury trial. It's a workers' compensation administrative law judge. Um, they issue a ruling. There's a lot of discovery that goes on before that, so it can be six months before we get before the judge. You know, that judge can take two or three months to rule. Um, and then as long as they're appealing it to the appellate division of the State Board of Workers' Comp, to Superior Court of the County, Court of Appeals, Supreme Court of Georgia, as long as they're appealing, even if they lose, they don't have to pay you a dime. Right. Um, so, I mean, the system's broken. In regard to Randy's earlier question about someone taking two years to actually get their benefits, um, the governor appoints the judge. And so if the, if the judge thinks my job is to protect management, my job is to make the stock market go higher, they're not as likely to find somebody who didn't report their injury the day that it happened to be entitled to benefits. Um, you know, secondly, the process is super slow. It can take two years going through before they finally get paid. So, you know, if you can pay attention to who's your legislature, you know, contact them, get them to change the law, who's the governor, who are they appointing, um, it, it makes important, you know, that's, that can mm. make a difference to workers' comp. Um, but, you know, just getting back to practical points that can help a worker, you know, like we talked about. Report. If, uh, yeah, report it. You know, and you have 30 days, but it's better to report it that day. Um, you know, tell your supervisor, but also, you know, tell the guy you're working next to or the woman you're working next to. What, what would you say to a member that, that said, um, it, look, I got hurt. I've got it documented. The company knows. I've reported it. But I don't need an attorney to do this. I, I can do this on my own. I don't want them to get a cut of my pie. Could you explain that's really not how it works? <laughs> um Sure. Yeah. And, that, and that's, you know, and that, that's a valid question. And I, I remember when I first became a lawyer, you know, 35 years ago, my father was kind of like, why, why do you need lawyers? Why are you doing this, Bruce, that, you know, somebody gets hurt, you pay for the medical treatment, you pay their wage loss, you know, where's the beef? Um, you know, I can, and so I can tell you that, you know, most people don't need a lawyer, um, you know, depending on how bad your injury is. And if you follow these steps, you know, if you document it, you know, if you, you have, you know, proof of what happened, um, you know, you pay attention to what doctor you go to. Um, you know, if they pay your benefits and you get well and you go back to work, I'll talk to you, but there's no reason for me to represent you. Um, but, but, you know, the, it's the case where the person, you know, gets hurt. The company says, no, you know, we think, you know, you had a prior back injury, so this is the same injury as before. You know, even though you worked for that company for 10 years, you know, without missing a day of work and then you get hurt and you can't work, and they don't pay it, um, you know, at that point, you need a lawyer, you know, and that's when I can come in and hopefully things are documented and I can, um, you know, work with the, 
trying to, to get other witnesses. You know, we had a case, you know, with Facebook recently where, you know, Facebook claimed, you know, there was a sign on the fence saying, don't climb this fence. And my worker, you know, was an electrician. The generator quit working, so he climbed the fence so he could put more fuel in the generator to keep it working so the gate would work. Um, you know, but Facebook said, no, you know, we're not going to pay this. You violated a safety rule. You climbed the fence. <laughs> Um, you know, and so a year later, the judge and the judge was angry at Facebook because we proved, you know, it was a union job. You know, I was able to line up six witnesses who said that that sign wasn't up on the fence until after he climbed it. Um, mm. And the judge, you know, he he was a good man. He said, I was I was in the Navy. I was an electrician in the Navy. You know, I know you do what it takes to get the job done. You know, this man was he wasn't climbing the fence on a bet. You know, he was doing it to to help Facebook out. Mm. Um but, you know, so in that situation, if they're not paying you benefits, you know, call a lawyer. But, but um, what about not just getting health care, but if I'm out of work <clears throat> three months, mm-hmm. even if they're taking care of my medical, I've got, I've got a house note to make. So, I mean, can't you, aren't you there to help negotiate what that looks like, a, some type of whatever restitution, if you will? Correct. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a baseball fan, so I do like to, to kind of look at what's the strike zone of workers' comp. Um, you know, they're not going to pay you pain and suffering. You know, you're not going to get a jury trial where your boss goes to jail for, for causing this injury. You know, I wish they could sometimes. But, you know, what you do get is you get, you get two-thirds of your pay. Um, you know, it's capped off at $675 a week, which a lot of folks in the trades are making you know, three that. times that amount. Yeah. Um, but it is important to document, you know, the amount you're making per week. You know, I see a lot of people, you know, if you're making – you know, straight pay and you're getting $20 an hour, 40 hours a week, $800 a week. Um, a lot of times the companies say, good, we'll pay you two thirds of your pay, 800. We don't include your overtime. You know, so if you're getting time and a half, you know, you might really be making 1200 a week. Um, and so if you continue working three months, but you're making less pay and you're making, you know, full time, 40 hours, but you're not getting your overtime, you should be getting two thirds of what you're losing. You know, to me, that's fraud. The insurance company, boom, they should they should check that. They should pay it. They shouldn't need to involve me. But, mm. you know, I would say 50% of the people I, I talk to are not getting paid the correct amount. You know, and that's something a lawyer can help you with is to try and make them pay the correct amount. Um, I would what, like to think if I hammer them enough, they'll quit doing that, but they, they keep Sorry, I'm just them. loaded with questions. Well, I was just going to ask about the about the overtime piece. You know, we have a lot of people working overtime right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> uh, we have a lot of unfilled job calls. The contractors are, you know, they, they're they pressing on and, and paying guys to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, how much liability is that? I mean, you know, I know that after working 70 hours a week, I'm a lot less – nimble than I was when I first started out, mm-hmm. you know, what, what, what is the company responsible for there? Even though there's an overtime clause, like wh- how much responsibility do they have in that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a good point. And I, you know, I mean, you know, being safe, I mean, I, I, I do represent the NFL players also in workers comp and, uh, you know, believe me, their union is like, you know, we can't, we don't want to have too many games. We want, you know, you have a concussion, we've got a protocol, you got to come out, you know, if you're, um, you know, baseball pitchers don't don't throw too many innings because you're going to blow your arm out. And uh, but the problem is, an electrician running running conduit. You know, okay, I know you're 80 hours in, but we got to get this done. Right. Um, you know, I mean, once again, I mean, that's where it's good to have a union. <laughs> you can file a grievance and say I'm I'm working too many hours. They're going to fire me if I don't come in. Um, but it does create more injuries. It does. You exactly. know, if you're if you're not fresh, you know, if you're 40 hours in, yeah, I'm paying attention. But by the time your your back hurts and you're tired. It makes We're for six more tens for the last sixteen mm-hmm. weeks in a row. You know, it's right. tough. what about mm-hmm. somebody that suffers a, a, an injury? All right, so in the trades, you know, we've got to be able to do certain things. We, mm-hmm. We've got to lift certain amount of weight. We've got to climb ladders. We've got to hold stuff above our head. Uh, what happens to an individual who loses the ability to do one or more things that would enable him not to necessarily be rehired? How does that look in a workers' comp case? Um, and, and it's a big problem. I mean, you know, you do see that, you know, with a rotator cuff injury where. Yeah. You, and I, you, I was I mean, about you, to say that. Let, let's say can't, I can't hold up r- duck, you know. Uh-huh. So, so what happens to Randy in that case in my livelihood? I'm making, you know, $80,000 a year and all mm-hmm. of a sudden my career has gone. What, what, what compensation is there for that? Um, yeah, it's a great point. And, 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 and of course the one problem is, is a lot of people, you know, kind of circling back to the doctor. 
Um, if it's a company doctor, you know, and I hate to be paranoid, but but in medical care with workers' comp, you got to be paranoid. You got to pay attention. You know, is this a doctor that everybody gets sent to when they're hurt? Um, are they more likely to, you know, they'll do surgery and you're back to work in four weeks. And, hey, my doc, my shoulder still hurts. Well, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just keep doing that. Sure. Um, but, you know, so if you have a good doctor who documents that you can't raise over your head, um, you know, it should be documented because you could be hurting yourself worse by doing that. You know, if you were working 80 hours a week and now, hey, come on back. We got you full time 40 hours. They should be paying you that two thirds of what you're losing. Um, and at some point, you know, if they say, look, you have to be full duty to work this job. Um, I'm a workers comp lawyer, but there is the Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, that, that if a company says you have to be full duty to work here, but wait a minute, you know, there, I see 20 jobs around here where people are working on a bench or they're able to work, you know, below shoulder level. Sure. Um, you know, so at some point file a complaint with the uh, EEOC, you know, for a handicap or, discrimination. Or you could claim. ask for a special accommodation mm -hmm. under the Correct. American Dis I did that for a member yeah. one time. You you have the right rut to I had a member, it's kind of funny, but he was a security guard down at Fort Benning and he was falling mm -hmm. asleep on the job and uh they wanted to discipline him. And of course my job is to figure out first of all, why does he need to be disciplined? But he was falling asleep. But he had a problem. He had a, he had a sleep apnea. And uh and so medical conditions covered under the American Disabilities Act. So I uh, grieved it and wouldn't let them discipline him and then asked for an accommodation, uh, which moved him from the third shift to the first shift. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, truck drivers use these things all the time, but there's a thing you can put in your ear. It's not implanted. It's a device that when your head tilts a certain degree forward, it beeps uh -huh. and wakes you up. So they not only had to move him to the first shift, they had to provide one of those for his ear, so if he fell, start to fall asleep, it would wake him up. I think I might need to have one of those what was <laughs> conversations with my wife. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah you exactly. Go. But oh, sorry, I, I was, I was I just, I'm kidding. Is there any, <laughs> watching, is there any, <laughs> I guess my question was, is there any obligation for a company mm -hmm. to find other employment for you if you were hurt on the job and I no longer can perform construction over my head? Do they have a liability to, to put you in another capacity? Is, could that be part of a settlement? I guess that's a question. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's lots of good questions here. Um, yeah, and that that's good also. Is that I mean, I think that you know you probably get into you know if you're hired to be an electrician and you know you're running conduit, you're you know putting it in the ground or running wire. Um, you know, I think within that, you know, they should accommodate you if they have other jobs in that category that you could do with a shoulder problem, and they don't want to accommodate you. Um, and there are certain time frames. You know, usually you sure. have you know maybe. You know, I won't even, <laughs> we're on camera here, but you know, I don't know. I mean, check with the EEOC, but yeah, I think it's like three months. You know, it's a pretty quick time period. Mm -hmm. You know, once again, you have six years to sue on a contract, but you got three months to complain about, you know, not, you know, being discriminated against. But, you know, so file that. And, you know, so then if I'm representing you or by yourself, when it comes time to settle the workers' comp case, you know, they're going to come in and they're going to say, okay, well, you just settled your workers' comp. You know, by the way, you have to sign this release, you know, where you're waiving all these other claims that you might have had. Um, and we want you to resign from the job. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about that. We did uh, yesterday, earlier. yeah, um, yeah. You know, and so it's better to so, be prepared for that when they when they start throwing that paperwork at you. So, Rut, they actually, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, will make you sign a paperwork saying you'll never work for X company again. Like a non-compete? Uh, yeah. Like a non-work here again. Uh, huh. Just, mm -hmm. you'll ne you know, company X, I, I, I filed a workers' comp against them, like I, I won, whatever. Usually, in the construction trades that I have seen, it's almost always a paper in that packet that says you'll never work for X again. Huh. And then that's just part of the deal. So what, so Bruce, what, when do you, 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 um, mentioned that, you know, a lot of times people don't need an attorney and I appreciate that answer mm -hmm. because, uh, 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 uh fortunately there, there's a lot of people say you, you need, you know, like if you're, if you're doing whatever you're doing, that's what that person needs. My wife had a situation with her back at one point and she went to a surgeon cause her father was a surgeon. Well, the surgeon said, what, what did the surgeon say? You need a surgeon. You need surgery, right? <laughs> well, right, right, right. She, yeah. she did some, some, some sort of orthopedic thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, she did some, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, did some things that, that um, you know, uh, therapy-wise that, that cured the problem, mm -hmm. right? So so I appreciate that, that mm -hmm. you said sometimes you don't. When do you need to co contact? If you've been hurt on the job, when do you need to contact? What are some, scena some typical scenarios where, you know, you really should probably think about hiring an attorney to deal with this and – what is the fear around uh, with construction workers where, you know, like, oh, I can't afford that. I, I'm going to get fired. Mm -hmm. the, the fear factor of, you know, 
attorney's going to, you know, Sure. Yeah. Me. Yeah. That's a good, good question. And, uh, and like you say, if you're, if you're doing a will, you know, get a lawyer, don't do it yourself. You right. Know? So, so same thing with workers comp and, and a lot of it depends on the seriousness of the injury. You know, if, if you sprain your ankle and you miss two weeks of work and you're back at work and you know, they've paid your medical treatment, they've paid two thirds of your pay. Um, I'd be glad to talk to you, you know, call me, you know, call another attorney and they'll, they'll usually give you, you know, 15 minutes of, you know, here's what happened but I probably wouldn't represent you in that kind of case. But, you know, where you absolutely need to call a lawyer, you know, is, is, you know, a more serious injury. You know, if a doctor is talking back surgery, you need shoulder surgery, you know, this is a life-changing injury that's going to be with me for, you know, more than two or three months. Or the company's denying Correct. Or, or, yeah, that it happened on the job. Um, yeah, or, or if it's a hernia and you might, you know, if you have surgery, you'll be well and back at work, right. you know, no big deal. But if they deny your hernia surgery and suddenly you're – you know, six months and you're waiting for surgery, you know, that, that's when to call a lawyer. So, so, so another question I had was, look, we have a, a company that does Cornerstone, and they, they provide disability benefits, and they're doing a lot with it's IBW. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, Rhett and I think a lot alike. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, and we're different heights, and we still think a lot alike. But anyway, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. let's say that I'm a member that, that decides I'm going to buy this product, disability product. Mm-hmm. And now I've got it hurt on the job and I've got, you know, this is paying me X amount of whatever I've signed up for. It could be 60% of wages, whatever the number is. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Then I win a worker's comp claim. Is there any, do I have to forego any money here? I mean, does the, does the worker's comp people care that I paid for my own disability or does the disability people generally care that I got a claim? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there any law saying I can't draw from both? And a lot of it, it comes down to the contract with your disability insurance company. Um, and so a lot of those contracts will say, you know, if you're drawing workers' comp benefits, you can't draw disability benefits at the same time. Really? You, know, you can't get you can't get two I can see that. They don't want to even if you bought a, a third party product. Mm-hmm. I can see really? what you know what it is. They don't want to pay insurance benefits when it's under the watch of someone else's insurance. So think about it. An insurance, a disability insurance doesn't want to pay if contractor X is really responsible for your injuries, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that isn't that what it all boils right, down right. to? Yeah, and, and there's probably some, you know, if you're getting two-thirds of your pay from workers' comp and two-thirds from disability, where you're making 150% of what you were making when you were working. <laughs> um, yeah, and not all of them may be written that way, but mm-hmm. but I, that's what I wanted to get to yeah, because yeah, so. a lot of times the disability things is really what happens when you're not at work. Correct. Right. But, you know, but, I mean, bottom line, Randy, I, I would recommend you buy disability insurance. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, a couple of reasons for it. And, and one is like you're talking about the worker that it took two years to get his workers comp benefits. So a lot of the policies say if you're getting workers comp, you can't get your long term or short term disability through this private policy. But if you're not getting even, you know, even if you're saying, hey, this is workers comp, they I'm taking them to court. They should be paying workers comp. You it was still, denied. You can st- and it's denied. You know, you can still draw your your disability insurance. And that's a big game changer. I mean, right. I have a case now where someone's drawing disability insurance. You know, he works for a, a certain beverage company over on North Avenue. Yeah. Won't, won't name names. but I hear you. <laughs> you know what, though? I don't want to – I know this could open and a can And they're of, starving him out. You know, so yeah, sure. Um, and they're, they're like, hey, we'll offer you, you know, some lowball number. And if he wasn't getting his disability, yeah, $10,000, that'll save my house. I got to take it. Yeah. Even though my case is worth $200,000. I got to feel mm-hmm. like that starving out thing happens a lot more. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. You get a big company. You got one person they're against. They just say, yeah, oh, we'll throw – some yeah, yeah, yeah. It's to starve you yeah, out. That's an interesting term. The uh-huh. But yeah. there's something yeah. else you you need to to know too. Mm-hmm. That I mean, the, the, man, you could. There, there's so many things that members need to be aware of. But let's say you draw that disability, whether it's from the health and welfare plan or a subsidiary benefit that you're paying for personally, mm-hmm. and then rut a year later, you get a payment of workers' comp. You better expect your health and welfare plan is probably going to come knocking on the door wanting some money back. It happened in our plan. Uh, really? Absolutely. So we, and it, it was, we've had one with a workers' comp issue that way, and we had one, because most plans say what you said, it'll say, I know you're not a health and welfare plan, uh, uh, attorney, but they'll say, if, if this is a workers' comp claim, you know, we're not paying you disability. Well, if they lay out those funds, and then a year later, it's, you won the case, they're going to want restitution paid back to the plan. We had a guy that was uh, hurt in an automobile accident, totally different, but uh, <laughs> we paid his health and well, we paid his, you know, injuries. 
then he got a claim. We sent a notice. Well, by the time we sent the notice and he got his claim, two Harley Davidsons and a truck later, he owed the plan $100,000. Wow. He got a hundred grand, but he bought Harley Davidsons and, and a truck. <laughs> now we're coming after him for a hundred grand. So it's just something that mm. members need to be thinking about. You know, when you get that check, make sure you ain't paying nobody. You know, right? I mean, that's just something they need to be aware of, right? I mean, Absolutely. That yeah, yeah, it's a problem. And, and, and the purpose is at least you saved your house while you were getting Absolutely. The, 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 the other benefits. And there is, I mean, you get in some nuances of it if it's a, I'm not sure how your plan is, and we can talk some more about yeah, it, yeah. maybe structure it, and it'll help me advising your members or maybe sure. you how you're doing it. Because there is a deal where under ERISA, you know, the federal law, if the company provides disability insurance um, or the company provides health insurance, you know, then the company, and that might be with the health and welfare, you know, they're entitled to, to get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. If someone, if someone's, I'm paying my own premium, I bought this long-term disability insurance on my own, then there might not be a reimbursement from that plan. Correct. Yeah. So is, but, is that, is that different than like a paycheck protection type plan where you have a, an insurance policy that makes you whole in terms of your uh, total income? Um, yeah, and, and there's there are different types of plan, and so that's where you know I said it kind of comes down to the contract you're buying. Um, you know, so there may be some plans that you know you can get workers' comp that pays two thirds of your pay, and then you have disability that pays that extra third. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so you maybe you are getting benefits over and above your workers' comp. Mm. Um, but but you know, like I said, I, I would advise getting long term disability insurance, short term disability, because I see that especially with high wage earners where. You know, hey, I'm, I'm used to making 1500 a week, and even if I'm getting workers' comp, I'm only getting half of what I was getting before or being starved out. Um, you know, and, it, and like I say, it's kind of like the professional football players. You know, you can bet high wage earners they have disability insurance over and above workers' comp. I mean, workers' comp's important. You know, if you get it, it'll keep things together. Sure. But, but there are other, other things where if you're, you know, if you're smart about it and pre-plan, you can protect yourself. Is the, <clears throat> is the attorney fee on top of what the member or person should be getting according to the law? You don't, I, I guess my, my question is, do you cut into the 675 that they're supposed to be getting or the maximum number? So nor normally the way we would get paid is if, if the case settles, you know, which would be a more severe injury. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is that the law allows attorneys in Georgia, we can charge 25% of, of the settlement. Um, you know, there's no, there's no charge, you know, say you come to me, I've got this back injury, I need surgery. You know, we try the case and, you know, Randy Beal didn't tell anybody for 29 days after he was hurt. So we lost the case. Yeah, um, right. And I might have spent five thousand dollars, you know, to get a doctor's opinion for depositions, for you know, court, whatever. Um, but there's no charge to you, you right? Know, if we don't get you any money, you know, I would not take a percentage of what you're getting. Um, and same thing, if somebody calls me and says, "Look, I'm already getting workers' comp benefits, but I'm worried about surgery coming up," you know, I won't touch your, you know, your weekly benefits that you're getting. It's really the final settlement um, is where the fee would be taken. And the hope is, you know, if we can double the amount of money you're getting, sure, and I take twenty five percent, it's still still makes sense to have a lawyer in that situation. So it makes it important for you to be able to synthesize all that information because Correct. you you need to take on on cases that are legitimate cases as opposed to yeah that makes a lot of sense. I think it works uh -huh. similar to a car wreck deal where I've negotiated my own where I've got <clears throat> in an accident and I didn't do as well as the attorney did the next time. Mm. But I mean so I, I know there's value there. I mm. mean you know it's almost like a union rep. We know how to negotiate. But I don't know how to negotiate a workers' comp claim. Right. You know, that's what your specialty is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know there's value there, but I just want the member to understand they're not out of pocket money. They're not, you know what I mean? I think so, because that, that makes them afraid. They're already losing I was, yeah, other I, things. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, do, do, you, do you lose opportunities, you know, as a, as, a, as a construction worker by thinking, yeah, I can't afford an attorney. Well, I'm just going to suck it up and move on. Right. I, I imagine that happens more often. Mm -hmm. than it does. I mean, yeah, and it's kind of twofold. I mean, they're, they're afraid of what they have to pay. So there's no charge, you know, basically, unless I increase what you're getting, I'm not going to, not going to charge you. And some people are like, well, my, my boss won't like me if I hire a lawyer. Um, you know, see so if you have a minor injury, it's, you know, unfortunately it's kind of like filing a divorce. Like, you know, well, she's mad at me because I hired a lawyer. Well, you're getting a divorce. Yeah. You need to protect yourself. Well, you're going to sign that paper at the end of the day. And uh -huh. most of the trade stuff, you're going to, you're going to say you're never working for that employer again. Yeah. And so it is a divorce. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, if you're in a small union where you may only have a dozen contractors, 
that, that scares people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what will happen, I mean, I know this happened to members in sheet metal, and, and I know what happens in others, is we might, we might got a hurt. We might got hurt on the job. We probably did. But we'll just say it happened at home, and it'll go through the health and welfare. Mm-hmm. And I, I hate to say that happens because it hurts the health and welfare plan, but it does. And because there's no risk there. You know, the, we've got disability built into our plans. They're usually not as good as workers' comp, but it doesn't take any time to settle it. You know, uh, it does take you the ability to lie about it yeah, because they want to know how you got hurt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, well, I slipped in the yard. Yeah. I mean, you know, but, right, right. And- it, you know, the, the bottom line is we need to hold employers accountable when people get hurt on the job. Yeah, You know, I, I want to say this. Our members and, and the contractors as well has done a great job in making people safe. We're safer now than we've ever been. Uh, that doesn't mean people don't get hurt. Yeah. And I stand behind those employers that stand up and say, we're sorry you got hurt. We're going to take care of it. Those are the good ones. And mm-hmm. then there's those that are not. And we need to hold their feet to the fire. And it's up to the member and that brotherhood and sisterhood to rally around them to make sure they can withstand whatever financial pressures come their way to help them get there. Yeah, well, and, and the overarching a deal there is, you know, if you're a member of a union, then chances are you have a decent retirement so that when your shoulders go out, when you're in your 50s, mm-hmm. 60s, you're, you, you know, you have yeah, to you're do some. Yeah, yeah. You I, sure don't, I don't see it. many union workers that are 75 years old, like I, like I see, <laughs> you know, waiters <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, or if I can, but just one point about the, sure. the health and welfare, because, and, and it is, I mean, I, you know, it's a conspiracy between, you know, the insurance company and the employer, and they try and draw the worker into it. Hey, you know, your back's hurting, but really, you know, even though you're, you know, you're having to load these pallets and, you know, it hurt worse and worse, you know, you can't, you didn't fall off the forklift. You didn't get, you know, get run over by somebody. It's just a gradual thing when you were moving that, you know, 50 pound bag of concrete. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it hurt a little Monday, worse on Tuesday, worse on Wednesday. On Thursday, you had to stop working, but you can't point to one particular thing that hurts your back. But if you have a gradual injury, it's still 100% acceptable under workers' comp. Um, and if your HR person comes to you and says, Hey, you know, sign this form, you know, you didn't really get hurt at work. You know, we'll, we'll get you to your health insurance doctor. We'll get you, you know, your benefits, no harm. But the problem is, you know, you might get six months of benefits under a short-term disability plan, but when that cuts off, then, Hey, I want to file my workers comp claim. And by then it's been six months. You've, you've signed a form saying it's not workers comp. Um, but to me, that's, you know, that company's committing fraud and they need to be called for it. You know, and if they just keep doing it, everybody's in bed with them, you know, it's it's a bad thing and it, it's draining the health and welfare fund that it shouldn't, you know, that should go to the workers' comp premiums. Absolutely. So, Bruce, how so, do... So, don't do that. <laughs> how do no. members mm-hmm. get in touch with you if they have any questions or whatever? Are you are you willing to field that kind of stuff? And, and if so, you know, how do they get in touch with you? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm, so it's Bruce Carraway. I'm, I, you know, we have a website. Um, you know, my number is 404-502-2772. Um, you know, I will say I've worked with uh, with David Moskowitz. We're, we're both um, in the IBW building here. Uh, you know, David's the one that brought me in. But so David and I both do workers' comp. We both, um, you know, handle a lot of union cases and are, and are proud, you know, to work with organized labor and and, uh, you know, are willing to answer questions, even if we don't represent you, at least, uh, you know, let's talk about it. Let's you know, let's get a strategy, you know, either, you know, with the, you know, with the shop stewards so they can protect people, but, you know, with the workers after the herd also. Yeah. And we'll have, <clears throat> we'll have David in, in another month just to get a, another perspective of, uh, this is a, 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 a terrible thing we have to discuss, Yeah, but it's so necessary for our brothers and sisters to understand the nuances behind workers comp. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to take this conversation and do some bullet points when we, when we post it, just because I, I want the first thing, even if they don't watch the video to say, you know, what is, what's the first thing you need to do when you get hurt on the job and your talk about documentation is Correct. important for uh-huh. sure. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for spending a little time with us and talking about workers comp and, um, and, uh, encourage any of the members if they've got a situation like that to contact you. Okay. Well, very good. Well, glad to be here. And, uh, th- thank you for the opportunity. Thanks Bruce. Uh, thank you. <clears throat>